Form councillors, officers and viewing public. Talking to this meeting of the Health and Social Care Overview and Scrutiny Committee. May I remind members that the meeting will be webcast or live on subsequent broadcast by the Council's Meetings YouTube site, and that members of the press and public may take photo, record and take photographs, except where there are confidential or exempt items. Can I remind officers and guests joining on Teams, please keep cameras and microphones off unless speaking, and please use the raise hand button if you want to speak. Second item is apologies, and I ask both members and scrutiny officer if there have been any apologies. Yes, is it okay, thank you for that. Uh, declarations of interest, can I ask members first if there any declarations of interest regarding today's meeting? Assuming that's that's no. Well, we're all better healthcare. <laughs> Okay, action notes matters arising. Can I ask members if they agree on the action notes or an accurate reflection of the meeting? And are there any matters arising from those notes? Can I ask uh, agree they are an accurate record, Chair. And uh, we still have bullet point two in your uh, notes of outstanding, which is the mapping or geographical representation of the primary care networks in the city. It's actually point that we will receive reports in this meeting of that situation. We had any feedback from them? Um, yeah. Okay, if we, get, if we get that chased off and see if we can get that within, within the next couple of weeks and we'll out to people. Okay, thank you. The first item of this public health update, and we're joined by Dr. Justin Varney, Director of Public Health, who's going to present an item, and we're joined online by Councillor Paula Hamilton and MP Paula Hamilton. So congratulations, Paula. Wondering if Paula, if you want to start off by saying a few words before Justin kicks off with the presentation. So Paula's computer has just checked out just as we do. So perhaps if Justin starts. Justin, do you want to uh, start? Yes, yeah, certainly, Chair. So um, I'm going to cover a range of uh, things today in the update and apologies I'm working on a split screen which is why you'll get side profile at, at points. Um, so first of all I just wanted to give an update on uh, the Covid situation. Um, so we continue to see cases rise um, across the city that's absolutely what we would expect to have happened as we've come out of restrictions uh, and people are socialising uh, more. Uh, testing rates have remained pretty stable, which is good. However, we are still awaiting national guidance on the who will be eligible for free tests after the 1st of April. And the advice to everyone is to please order through the national website this week so you can get uh, at, at least have some tests uh, for the, the coming days. Um, we are fortunately not seeing uh, the high case rates translate into hospital admissions into intensive care. However, we have seen more patients where COVID is diagnosed in hospital um, than in previous uh, the previous period. Um, and what we're seeing really is that COVID with uh, vaccination <clears throat> is not a great experience for people, but it is not putting people into intensive care and they're not requiring the significant amounts of oxygen that they were before we had the vaccination programme. However, for those that are unvaccinated, it remains a very serious illness. Um, and the NHS is at great pains to remind people that it's never too late to start your vaccine programme and that it remains what's called an evergreen offer, uh, where people can access vaccines through their GPs as well as through the vaccine sites. National Vaccination Programme extended the offer of a fourth dose to over 75s and to a specific cohort of patients who will be contacted by the NHS to invite them to come forward for that fourth dose. And that's about topping up the immunity levels to provide the resistance against the Omicron and the new subvariant of Omicron, which is very infectious. And the way that we reduce the risk of people ending up in intensive care or dying is by having those high antibody levels, which helps us win the battle uh, with Omicron. So there is still significant work going on jointly between the council and the NHS to increase the uptake of vaccine and to really focus on the wards where we have the lowest uptake. And we'll continue to report that through the local outbreak engagement board. Um, I'll pause there as I know Councillor Hamilton uh, has rejoined us and I know she was keen to say some uh, some words this morning. So Councillor Hamilton, I'll hand over to you. 
Thank you, Justin, and thank you, everybody. Um, I know this is my last meeting, so I was really keen to be here. First of all, to thank OSC for all the support they've given me over the years. They've been critical. Um, Rob has been phenomenal, and Mick has, you know, you've all been really, really good at really challenging what we've done in the executive, and I think it's made for a really good, um, a good good team working. But what I'd also like to do is publicly thank Justin for all his hard work. Sometimes we've been like mother and son. It has not always been the easiest relationship, but I just want to publicly say that his heart is in the right place. He's absolutely passionate. And these reports that I'm going to highlight, you know, he's pushed really hard, even with the issues of COVID. So I don't want people to forget just the the atmosphere we've been in and the phenomenal amount of work we've been able to achieve through public health over the last two years. So as I was saying, I'm delighted to be here today to provide the public health update. And Justin has actually provided a pack that should have taken you a good evening and plus another day to get through because it was quite um, a very thorough pack. But what I'm asking you to do is there are five areas, the Birmingham Healthy um, Health and Wellbeing Board, the strategy, creating a bolder, healthy city, um, Justin's annual report. But the report that I want you to really look at is that report by Birmingham and Lewisham, African and Quad. Uh, African and um, Health Inequalities Review. I think that is groundbreaking. I'm really sorry I'm not going to be around to see that go further through Health and Wellbeing Board and some of the work that John Cotton's um, going to be doing. But it, I believe it's groundbreaking. It's honest. It's a really true reflection. And it's really, really shown when people work together and they're honest, what can be achieved. But also, um, the work we've done with creating a healthier food city food strategy. Again, that consultation has gone out. And can I say that that particular consultation ends, if I haven't got it wrong, because I've gone ahead of my notes. It's about the 19th of April, is it, Justin, that that consultation ends. Again, some of this work in the food strategy is absolutely groundbreaking. And it's something where I think over the next few years, we are really going to develop some phenomenal work. And finally, the work that we've done, we are doing through the Birmingham and Soliol Health um, strategy consultation. Now, myself and Justin, we've had long conversations about this one because we wanted to ensure that the work that we did in this area, that um, we did it over a longer period of time, we were more mindful about what we were doing and that we ensured we were more inclusive with this piece of work. Now, the consultation will start from the 28th of March, which was yesterday, and it will run until midnight night on Tuesday the 26th of April. We have had some key reports um, over the last few years, um, but the one that I'm going to highlight again is the Health and Wellbeing Board strategy. For me, going forward with the ICS, this is absolutely key that we are clear on what our strategy is around the Health and Wellbeing Board. Now, I am going to move straight on to um, I'm going to move straight on to um, health literacy, which is the last item that I, I'm going to talk about. And the review calls for the Health and Wellbeing Board and the NHS um, to be integrated the integrated care system to work with local community and, vol and the voluntary sectors and partners to develop a targeted program on health literacy for the Black and African Caribbean community. I don't just think it will be for the Black and African Caribbean community, as Justin will go into more depth because there is so much going on that within that um, that work we've done around the Lewisham work, there are 39 um, 
detailed opportunities for action. And I'm sure Justin doesn't mind say, me saying some of the um, the outcomes I worried about because when he raised them with me, I said, what will people say? And he said, counsellor, don't buckle now. <laughs> Let us be brave, you know, and I just want the Health and Wellbeing Board to look at this. I know I've gone back to it, but I think it's really important that we see some of that groundbreaking work. And as as was highlighted, the reports presented are for over for the overview and scrutiny committee to actually note the progress, especially re-COVID response, which Justin has already highlighted, to support and promote the consultation on the food and sexual health and reproduction health strategies, to review and consider the recommendations of that review that I like that I think we've done some good work on, which is the um, Lewisham. African and Caribbean Health Inequalities Review and to receive and consider the Birmingham Health and Wellbeing Board strategy, which will be key for the next cabinet member coming in, going forward, will what we will do between now and 2030. This is a live document and it will need tweaking at points. But what this does is it absolutely adds the structure for how we go forward, but also finally to for the board to receive the annual um, report of the public health director, which I know Justin is truly proud of. He'll always say it's a little bit behind councillor and I know that um, next year we will catch up, but it's because of everything that we're doing. But I think some of the issues he's highlighted, which I'll leave for him to talk in more detail, he's absolutely hit the nail on the head. So I'm going to stop there because um, I could go on forever, but I feel as I've given you a flavour as the outgoing cabinet member and the person who's coming in to take this role, they have got absolutely a really good framework to start from and to help them build on the direction they want to go forward with. And on that note, I will shut up and adjust it over to you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor. I mean, I think um, not significant uh, things to add. I should say, though, to start off with, I think it has been a, a team effort um, and it, it has been a pleasure to work with Councillor Hamilton uh, over the last three years. And, and as she's described, um, many of the things that I think we have achieved and actually that we're bringing to scrutiny today are a reflection of Birmingham being much bolder and braver to really talk about the inequalities that affect our city with citizens in a co-production approach and not to shy away when things are not comfortable to talk about. Um, and I think through the, the public consultations that we have, um, we're repeating what we did with the health and wellbeing strategy where we're commissioning focus groups to support the consultation with citizens that we know don't use the Be Heard platform. So we're delving deeper to ensure that their voices uh, contribute and inform our approach. Um, and we that was reflected actually in the way that we provide reports, both in the health and wellbeing strategy uh, post consultation, but also in the DPH report where you've seen in the documents that the voices of citizens are woven through the documents and they are truly anchored in the lives of the residents of Birmingham. Um, finally, I just echo Councillor Hampton's point around the African and Caribbean Health Inequalities Review. I would um, really ask scrutiny to read that in detail and to use it as a document to hold uh, both public health but the wider health system um, to account. We are taking it to the ICS Inequalities Board and the expectation is it will go to the ICS's uh, full board for consideration. Um, many of the detailed 39 recommendations in the review are very specific to health services, but there are also some that are very specific to social care. And I would ask scrutiny to consider in your review over the next two years how you can keep coming back to these recommendations, um, which were co-created with citizens and with academics to be evidence-based, but also based in lived experience to hold us all to account to 
make our city work better for our African and Caribbean communities who suffer some of our most severe and significant health inequalities. Um, but I, I know I gave you a very comprehensive pack and apologies for the volume of pre-reading, but I hope uh, the committee has had a chance to review it and I'm happy to take any questions on any of the items we're bringing today. Okay, thank you. Before we, we go on to questions, I'd just like to place on record in perspective of the support of the committee, the, the thanks we want to for Paul Letts for all the work she's done as a cabinet member in this area across the recent years. So thank you, Paul Letts. Certainly. So questions we've got, Councillor Tilsley. Thank you. Uh, first of all, can I echo um, the chairman's comments, Paul Letts, um, about the work that you've done and I've enjoyed working with you uh, now that you've gone on to greater things. Um, <laughs> you'll find you're a very small fish in a very, very big pond. You were a very big fish in a small pond here. Um, and uh, you you, you uh, counted very much uh, for that. Um, I wanted to focus on the comments that uh, Justin made regarding COVID. Uh, because um, I do a weekly um, printout to um, uh, people in, in Sheldon and the positive COVID tests doubled um, up until last Friday, which was uh, obviously a concern. It's a concern because with the lateral flow tests, um, finishing at the end of the month, uh, people are going to be left high and dry. And this was reinforced uh, to me yesterday when my wife had uh, an email to say that she'd been in contact with uh, somebody who was positive on a specific day. That specific day happened to be uh, last Saturday when she hadn't been out of the house. Um, so you could have a situation where people are running around scared uh, unnecessarily and not being able to take any tests to back it up. And the final point that I'd make is that uh, you, you're perfectly right in your analysis, Justin. Um, up until last Friday, there was only one patient in um, UHB beds that was on a ventilator. So obviously, um, the current virus um, is less toxic than previous uh, viruses have been uh, of COVID. But I am concerned, very concerned, what is happening in China and what has happened in Hong Kong over the last few weeks, because we've seen, uh, particularly in Shanghai, it goes through the roof. And uh, I think if I'm reading right, the health system in Hong Kong is really struggling to deal with the current outbreak. And unfortunately, as we've found out, no man is an island and COVID doesn't respect um, seas, oceans or borders. So I am concerned about a possible uh, further outbreak that could um, start the process all over again. Chair, if I could just re respond to the, the points that the Councillor makes, um, particularly about China and Hong Kong. I think the key thing for us to reflect on is that particularly in Hong Kong, the level of vaccination uptake is very, very poor, particularly in the elderly. So it's less than 60% coverage of full vaccination uh, in the elderly population. Now in Birmingham, I'm delighted actually that when you look at our most elderly, particularly our over 75s, it's over 83%, I think when I last looked, are triple vaccinated. So you know, although we still face real challenges in younger adults getting the vaccine, where there is still a risk both of severe illness, but also of long COVID, um, but in our most vulnerable groups, people have listened, have engaged, have talked to us and have taken the step to protect themselves. Um, so I am taking some solace from that. However, there is, of course, the ongoing concern that where we see case rates rise across the world, there is an increased risk of a new variant occurring that would cut through the vaccine. 
Um, and so far, we've yet to see one that does bypass the vaccine. Um, but it remains a concern, particularly when we see large outbreaks in poorly vaccinated populations, as we are in China and Hong Kong at the moment. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Fowler. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, just to, first of all, I'd like to echo everything that's been said um, to all the pandemic, uh, to a world of grace. A great big thank you to you for all the work you've done both at the um, Council here and also your reports that you've done uh, on local TV as well. I think I found that incredibly helpful and I'll have my book around for you to sign it later on if you wouldn't mind. Uh, Paulette, and what can I say, Paulette, uh, Chair, uh, pardon me for a few moments, that uh, um, personally I think Paulette and I have worked together. Uh, you've done some kind words and reciprocated in when we were in the uh, chamber. And it's sad that I'll not be able to do that again um, when it is returned, subject to being re-elected, of course. But uh, the one thing that uh, endeared me so much, Chair, uh, was when uh, I did tell my other half, I said, Paulette said one well, of the nicest things um, on the team's meeting, and she called me an elder statesman. <laughs> I'm probably I'm not going to show it's about the grey hair that's increasing. Um, but uh, thank you. Um, you will not go. No, not bad. I'll do a swap. <laughs> not bad for 69, ain't you? Um, on the uh, uh, Birmingham Use and Report, which I have, I have to admit, it's, it's a big document and one of the things I haven't read it in its entirety, but we'll have the opportunity uh, to do that. But one of the things that we've always talked about, uh, Paulette, Justin, is about the um, public engagement. Um, and thank goodness that we're, going, we're moving away from that BAME title that I've heard so many people on TV saying we're all moving away, thank goodness for that. But again, through my work with Councillor Cotton Chair, that through the social inclusion and equalities, it's something I've been very, very passionate on, is ensuring that uh, our black and ethnic minorities are given more opportunities. And I think that is slowly happening. And I'm just wondering, uh, Justin, as well, I was looking at the public engagements where I saw online public events, focus groups, and even one-to-one -one interviews but I just wondered what your thoughts were of actually how we could even further improve the engagement of those communities, because I still think there is a little bit of a barrier there. And I'll say even maybe a little possibly, and you will obviously tell me if I'm right or wrong, there is tends to be a little bit of mistrust. I'm hoping that is slowly being eradicated. I'll hold it for there for a moment, Chair. Thank you. So I, I think on, just on the point of the engagement, um, I think in public health, we have tried to uh, develop different ways of engaging with citizens and with communities. Um, I think some have been more successful than others. Um, and alongside that, we've been developing skills and community development uh, work has been going on to strengthen some of the uh, community organisations working with specific communities who we struggle to engage with. And a lot of that has been about building trust. Um, and I think one of the positive legacies of the pandemic is that we have rebalanced some of the relationships uh, between the council and particularly with our faith leaders, where I think um, we have worked hand in hand through the pandemic extremely well and created very different conversations uh, and relationships, um, which we are now looking at how can we sustain and, and move forward. And I hope uh, after the election, I will bring back to scrutiny the new faith setting toolkits that we commissioned uh, just as we were coming into the pandemic, which are now finally ready uh, for publication and a good example of that about how we have co-produced with faith communities guidance specific to their faith and their delivery of their faith to improve the broader health and wellbeing agenda. Um, I think the other thing to say is this is not unique to the council. The issues of trust and relationship with communities are very acutely felt by the NHS. And one of the things that we are also doing is learning together as a city and, and as a partnership. So uh, later next week, next Friday is, 
um, I'll be spending a day with NHS leads on um, communication and engagement to share our learning from the pandemic, which is seen as national best practice, um, but also working with them on how we can as a system um, be a bit smarter so that we don't over survey communities, that we don't keep knocking on the same doors, that we look and identify where gaps are. Um, but we also recognise that everyone can't have a relationship with every community all of the time and how we can be smarter working together to support communities moving forward. Um, and I'm really pleased that that is now a uh, collaboration which is evolving between the council, the NHS, and we are inviting the police to join us as well. So it really is starting to reflect the city partnership working uh, more effectively with citizens. Um, but if there are specific ideas, Councillor Fowler, you want to share, do drop me an email. Always happy to have suggestions and always very pleased to come to ward forums with members to talk about the work we're doing and, and to feed, uh, get feedback direct. And um, Councillor Brown will remember I went up to uh, Gravely Hill early on when I'd arrived and you know I'm keen to get back out again in person into our wards and, and see citizens face to face with this work and we hope to be able to restart that when we're invited as well by members. Thank you just before I bring uh, Councillor Pope okay hey, what, did, you, did you want to come back? I, I just wanted to add one thing to that um, that what Justin has said for me as a um, person of colour myself the evidence is there. What the Lewisham report has done is we've stopped talking about evidence because the evidence have been has been there over a number of years. What we've concentrated on, and I think Justin will agree, is how we can solve what we're finding. Because the reason the communities don't trust us is because what they're saying is the evidence is there. We keep speaking to them. We're saying that they're hidden or something is wrong with them, but we're not then acting on the information that's been given. And what I'm hoping will happen with this report, the recommendations, we have made a promise from the very start that the recommendations will be acted upon. So what I'm asking of scrutiny, and Justin alluded to it earlier, is that you keep challenging the executive through the work that John Cotton's doing, through public health and others, that the recommendations are acted upon because people won't be as open next time if we have this comprehensive review and then we don't complete it. And we want to do the same again. And again, Justin will tell you, we've done little snapshots of other communities, but I know we'll be going in and we'll be doing work with our Sikh community. We've started work with our Muslim community. So it isn't just based in the African and Caribbean community. This was the start point. But the point of this exercise is it will be spread out through other communities that at the moment feel that the evidence is there, but there's no action being taken. So that's what I wanted to add. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Pocock. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Three points, if I may. First of all, to echo the points others have made, congratulations to Paulette and obviously to Justin for the leadership you've shown uh, for this council over the period of COVID. Right, you've taken Birmingham to the top of the tree, I think, nationally, both political and professional leadership. And we've seen Birmingham rise, I think, in public health terms, to be recognised as a real a centre of excellence for how a local authority, as complicated as Birmingham, can tackle these issues. So I think you both need a real um, commendation for the work that you've done there. Paul, as I look forward to seeing you on the, on the Health Select Committee. I'm sure Jeremy Hunt's got a vacancy for you there. Uh, uh, Rob, they've already offered me one, but let me get, yeah. let me, I am not taking anything on until Erdington is secure. <laughs> And second point, I'm concerned about where we are and where we're going with, with uh, COVID. Um, we've got no restrictions, we're behaving back to normal, we've got the, pretty much the highest infection rate we've seen in the last two years. Yes, people aren't dying as fast as they were before, as, as prevalently, um, but we're still losing 1,000 people a week, I think at the moment, 50,000 people a year. You know, two years ago, this would have been absolutely unsustainable. The effect on the workforce, sickness absence, we know. Um, and yes, the messages going out are clearly not 
um, having any effect on the prevalence of the infection in the population. And I'm just worried that this is becoming the norm. We can't carry on this way. Something has got to be done to make the um, uh, to, to take an initiative, basically, to really address how we deal with the situation that we've got now. We don't want to go back down to lockdowns, but clearly what we're doing now isn't working. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the situation we've got. So comments, I think particularly Justin's way, uh, would be really helpful. The final point was on the public health strategy, along with an extensive document. I was impressed by the fact we've done a rapid health impact assessment, a really interesting kind of oversight on it. There's some quite cutting recommendations in there, so I just wondered maybe, Justin, if you'd like to highlight how you've taken on board some of those comments. And the um, tendency to use a lot of jargon it infects the public health world, as it does many professions, um, to de-jargon your report will be a big challenge. So I'd be interested in what you've done to respond to those quite challenging comments that have been made in the health impact assessment. Thank you. Um, so I think uh, as an officer, I, I will uh, dodge the question on government policy at the moment, if I may, but uh, I I have uh, profiled our approach and our resources for COVID response to take us through to September to provide uh, reassurance to the council and to partners that we are able to rapidly step back up uh, a full response from public health and the council should it be required. Um, and I feel that that was a very judicious decision that we made back in the autumn and will see us well through what is undoubtedly going to be a slightly rocky uh, next few months while we settle into living safely with COVID. Um, I think in terms of the, uh, the feedback we had uh, in the consultation on the strategy, um, we did uh, amend the language to simplify it. Uh, I think what was really fascinating in terms of the engagement uh, through the consultation on the health and wellbeing strategy. Um, and we had to, to some extent, but a lesser, I think, with the African and Caribbean Health Inequalities Review, is that the citizens are very much split 50-50. 50% want us to be much more ambitious, and 50% feel we're being unrealistically ambitious. Uh, and my view is that because it's a 50-50 split, and it is pretty accurately 50-50, uh, particularly when you look at the free text commentary uh, that people have given, is that probably means we've got the balance about right. Um, had it been an 80-20 split, then, then I would be much more concerned and we would have, uh, I think, amended more visibly some of the uh, ambitions. Um, but there is quite a strong divide in, in terms of feedback from people who feel we should be even bolder in our ambitions for the city and we should be much more aggressively trying to close the gaps and um, those who feel that we shouldn't over promise uh, and under deliver and I think that's really what was was coming through. Um, I should also say one of the things I'm very very pleased about for the health and wellbeing board strategy particularly um, was we got a very considered response during the consultation from the academics of the universities of the city who collaborated across institutions to put in a formal response to the consultation. Um, and that response was incredibly positive. As you would expect, they highlighted some very specific things that they felt we could do and use from their knowledge of the evidence base. But it is also a reflection of how we've engaged differently through this work. Um, and different in our approach over the last couple of years to engage more of the city and more of the assets that we have in the city, our vibrant communities, our academic institutions, and get their brains and their experiences to bear on what we're trying to do. So um, I feel in, in the consultations we have demonstrated, we have listened. Um, the, it is important to say the health and wellbeing strategy in itself is an umbrella strategy. Underneath it will sit a series of delivery 
uh, frameworks and action plans and the food strategy is the first example of that coming through. Um, and we did a lot of pre-consultation work on the food strategy, uh, which I feel does make it a very accessible um, document that doesn't have a lot of jargon in it. It's, it's very much written, um, so it is accessible. Um, but it is something we have to keep coming back to. How do we make sure that our language ensures that all of our citizens understand what we're trying to do and how they can work with us to achieve those outcomes? Hey, thank you, Justin. Uh, I've got a question, well, a comment first, Justin, regarding Gravely Hill. They really enjoyed you coming down there, so hopefully in the near future they'll to get down again. Uh, I wanted to sort of build on Councillor Pocock's question about COVID and the concerns that he actually raised. If you indicated that figures are actually increasing, is that any in any particular demographic? Is it in regards to people who are vaccinated and unvaccinated? And is it rising disproportionately in specific geographical areas? Thank you. So um, it's important to say that the vaccine does not stop you catching COVID. Um, it does reduce your chances of catching it and it does reduce your chances of passing on. But it, its real strength comes in stopping you becoming severely unwell and dying. Um, and most vaccines don't don't stop give a hundred or don't stop it completely or don't give a hundred percent protection against infection. So we are seeing people who are vaccinated catching COVID. Um, with the new version of Omicron, I would say most of the people I know who've had it have said it's pretty rough. It does feel like a bad flu uh, type experience, worse than, than when people had Delta. Um, but they're not so sick that they're ending up in hospital. Um, and what we're seeing is that the people who do end up in intensive care and do end up in oxygen are the people who are unvaccinated. And and that you know, that is the clear message. Every bit of research is saying the same thing. COVID is a serious illness if you are not vaccinated. The very rare side effects from the vaccine are far, far less common than the same things happening due to COVID infection. Um, and if we can continue to keep a high level of vaccination and in those that have got immune systems that don't work as well, boosting them through a fourth dose gives that extra protection as well, then we probably can move more confidently into living safely with COVID um, because the risk of death moves down to be much more similar to uh, seasonal flu. The challenge that we have is getting that vaccination level high and maintaining that immune response um, and at the moment, the evidence that's being looked at nationally says it is the most elderly and those whose immune systems that don't work well, their immune system drops off quite quickly. That's why the fourth dose is needed. Whether that will be extended to other age groups later in the year or we may have a new jab in the autumn as part of the winter immunisation cycle, that's still being looked at and still being decided. But sadly, I fear we will be living with COVID for at least another year or two um, as the majority of the world are unvaccinated. Um, and that remains the challenge for us. We, we are a very vaccinated nation compared to others, and that's allowing us to navigate this slightly differently. Uh, from other countries where that protection is nowhere near as comprehensive. Okay, just a, a quick follow-up question. In terms of people that are unvaccinated, are you, are you managing to have any impact in terms of getting that number of people that have not taken the vaccine actually increased? Are we actually getting any impact in them? Um, yes, it is. There, There is evidence we are slowly chipping away. I would say that it's becoming um, harder and and you would expect that because in reality um, you the people that wanted the vaccine queued up um, the people who took a little bit of persuasion uh, came across the line uh, pretty fast um, uh, you know pretty quickly there is a group of people who said 
you know what i i I will have it but i kind of want to see a lot more people have it first all of this social media noise about risk just makes me a little bit nervous so I'll, i'll come a bit later on and you know the numbers we're seeing in birmingham in terms of people having starting their vaccine journey um ranges from about 180 a day to about 30 a day and and that varies with days of the week so on sunday there were only 30 uh, if I look back to where, you know last Monday or so, there were 130 who had their started their vaccine journey. Um, so you know I think we we're, we're seeing a small but steady trickle, um, and what we're finding is that that continued engagement, the continued saying, come and ask the question. There isn't a stupid question. You know if you've seen it on TikTok or you've heard it from a friend, come and ask someone who's qualified. Ask a doctor, ask a pharmacist, ask your GP. You, know, We're there to answer the questions because um, you've got a real concern. And if we can help answer that concern, that might help you make the decision to protect yourself through vaccination. So we're still continuing to chip away at it. And we're still seeing, you know, as I said, 30 to 180 a day still coming through. And the vast majority of that is being done in general practice and, you know, we're not seeing the mass vaccination sites anymore. Over 70% of the vaccines given in Birmingham have been done through general practice and community pharmacy. And that will continue to be the route in which people can still get their jabs um, if and when they, they change their mind and want to start uh, getting that extra bit of protection. Okay, thank you, Justin. A really comprehensive answer as always. Well, we've got through this particular section bang on time so i kind of thank everybody for that i kind of thank paulette and justin for the contributions you've made to this committee over the last 12 months back so thank you okay, so now we've got a presentation from the neighbor network scheme with kevin mccall and neil Plasky and benita wilshaw Again, could you three introduce yourselves and in terms of the presentation? Are you doing it yourself? Yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Calvin Coley and I'm uh, head of service uh, within the Department of Social Care. Uh, the area that I cover is uh, prevention and community assets and to the internet. Hi, I'm Benita Wishart. Um, I know many of you, and it's a pleasure to be back at Scrutiny, albeit on the wrong side of the table. <laughs> um, I now work at BBSE, and I'm supporting um, all the neighbourhood network schemes across the city in that one. Good morning, I'm Ian Pleasure, I'm a Commissioning Manager in House Team, and my role is to develop and uh, overview the neighbourhood network scheme in the I think it's and um, can we run in the slides? Thank you. OK, so what we'd like to do today is to give you a little bit of an overview around our neighbourhood network schemes. So some background. Um, we've also got a short film to share as well. And we'll also like to talk to you about the impact so far. And we've got some um, really exciting news as well in terms of next steps. But as you can see from the logo there, um, we've also been shortlisted in terms of the local government chronicle for 2022. Uh, so we're really excited about that. We understand that there were 750 uh, applications um, within the context of adult social care. They would pull those down to about 20, and we are on eight finalists in the category. So we're going forward into um, stage two. And Benita and I are going to London for a, a further presentation and an interview by the panel. Um, so watch this space. Uh, so I, I think uh, many of you will be uh, familiar with the context of neighborhood networks because it's probably been part of other adult social care uh, presentations. Uh, sorry, Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, but it is, Neighbour Networks is very much set within the uh, vision and strategy for adult social care, uh, which was refreshed in 2020, but the original strategy dates back to 2017. And that's very much about how we uh, support our citizens to live healthy, happy, independent lives uh, within communities, in touch with their friends and families, um, and very much independence at home. 
through support through communities um, and through uh, support with networks, etc. And also care within the home because often people, you know, that's what people want. They don't want to uh, go into uh, care establishments. They they draw the have care at home. So, but connected to that was very much um, the approach around investment and, and how you enable that uh, to happen. So there's there's three things that happen in this space. So obviously, firstly, is the uh, strength based approach to social work. Um, and also uh, locality working for, for social workers as well. And that's very much about social workers being grounded in communities, um, understanding what the assets and networks are within their assets so that they can do their jobs uh, in terms of uh, meeting the needs and aspirations uh, of our citizens. And then obviously uh, linked to that is the investment in uh, prevention. And this is investment in community assets, um, and also recognition that you need to move investment from the crisis space uh, into the prevention space if you're going to deliver that vision. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so in terms of our investment, we've got circa 30 million um, from adult social care invested in commissioning activity for prevention, community assets and earlier interventions. And neighbourhood networks is one example of that. There are many other examples that we're happy to uh, share with you as well. And, you know, sitting um, in the centre of that, and Justine talked about this earlier, is making sure that, you know, citizens are at the heart of everything that we do in terms of how we do business, in terms of how we design our activity. Um, so that co-design piece, both with communities and citizens, it is absolutely crucial to that. And there you can see the pre uh, prevention triangle, you know, making sure that that investment is in that prevention space very much as, as possible. But it's also recognising that both in terms of targeted support and crisis support, if you've got assets within communities, you can still make a preventative offer to citizens as part of their overall package of care. And we know, you know, we know from personal experience that that delivers far better outcomes uh, than pure um, a social care intervention on its own. And what we hope to achieve by that is, is you know, resilience in citizens and uh, communities, um, also an inclusion of the most vulnerable uh, within our communities. And the way that we deliver that is, is through effective uh, partnerships, uh, through co-design uh, with, with our uh, local stakeholders with the intention that we build those stronger communities and community networks. Thank you. So in terms of a, a fairly high overview of, of neighbourhood network schemes, so what are they? they they're commissioned uh, to work with social workers and other uh, stakeholders to develop the assets and the activities that support citizens uh, within their own homes and communities. It's based on need, it's based on interest and it's based on the aspirations of our citizens. The current focus is older people, but Emile's going to talk to you about the expansion of neighbourhood networks and next steps. Uh, there are currently 10 neighbourhood networks across the city and they, they sit within the parliamentary constituency boundaries and they support thousands of, of people each year to remain independent. Uh, their role um, is to um, asset map because there's, you know, lots of uh, activities and assets which are commissioned through adult social care that go on within communities and, and often it's that point about knowing where they are, knowing how to access them. Um, they engage with local stakeholders, uh, they identify gaps in activities uh, within the local areas and they use an allocated budget. So this is very much about responding to the needs that are identified through a micro-grants uh, commissioning approach. So the money moves from the council to community organisations into communities. Um, but it's coordinated within uh, the context and the vision for adult social care and delivering those outcomes. Um, as Benita's already um, said in her introduction, we've commissioned uh, BBSC to provide a coordination role across those 10 networks um, so that they can share information, they can share learning, we can identify, as commissioners, we can identify common patterns and trends. And, and that's really important because it means that 
Um, if it's an activity that needs to be invested in in a different different way through a different funding stream, we can do that um, and we take the intelligence back into social care. And it also means we've got that coordinated approach. So we've had a neighbourhood network since uh, 2018. And at this point, I would stop and say neighbourhood networks was not a Birmingham idea. Um, we're very thankful to Leeds City Council um, who had neighbourhood networks for the last 15, 15 years and have demonstrated both impacts and savings as a consequence of shifting that investment uh, into uh, prevention. They were very kind to us. They shared all of their learning. They also shared what went wrong and what we shouldn't do. And we took all of those uh, lessons and uh, we created a Birmingham version of neighbourhood networks, which, which works for our city. So um, the, the Birmingham model looks slightly different to the Leeds. Uh, so um, the, the neighbourhood network Leeds have commissioned over 460 grants worth uh, approximately 2.8 million in terms of this current uh, contracted uh, period. And um, you will hear very shortly neighbourhood networks have played an invaluable role in terms of our localities uh, during the pandemic. They've been absolutely phenomenal in the way that they've stepped up, adapted, adopted different approaches and, and no ask was too much of them. So they, they've been a real asset uh, to the city alongside the, the wider uh, voluntary and community sector as well. Um, I, I think I've already uh, covered this slide, uh, but we have, uh, as I say, 10 neighbourhood networks across the city, started back in 2018. The first two were in-house um, and they're still running uh, through our neighbourhood development unit. Um, so uh, Selly Oak and uh, Perry Bar, and the remainder are deliver delivered through mainly community and voluntary sector organisations, a lot of them in partnership with other community and voluntary sector organisations, and one by a housing association, which is Green Square Accord. Okay, so just sharing a little bit in terms of the investment in uh, neighbourhood networks. Originally funded in terms of our trial period through the Improved Better Care Fund. And that's because our partners in health also recognise the importance of having uh, neighbourhood networks in the city and the role that they could play. Um, Emil will talk shortly around the alignment with uh, social prescribing as well and our journey with, with health. But that was the start of things um, and, and it certainly uh, put us in good stead. So then the budget moved to adult social care based projects, so 2.57 uh, million. And um, in terms of the next round of recommissioning, we've added to that uh, budget um, simply because we've seen the impact and the benefits um, of that investment and we want to do uh, more in that space. Now, what we'd like to do is um, share a film with you. And um, this uh, film was created originally for uh, New Local. They asked for evidence across local authority areas of um, leadership around community powers. This is very much around communities um, co-creating solutions for themselves within the context of health and social care. Um, we're really uh, pleased with, with, with the film and we also shared it as part of our LGC submission as well. Uh, so it's, it's clearly uh, landed well. So I, I hope you enjoy this and then we'll come back and finish the rest of the presentations. Yeah, very <laughs> Here we go. The volume was working just before when we tested it with the very small. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah. It's normally an option at the top, isn't it, of the screen? Yeah, it, pops it, up, it was. But I'm not there to eat it with our Sorry. Sarah, would you mind trying to share from your side? Yeah, probably. Thank you. 
There isn't an option at the top if you scroll up to the top of the screen. Normally a pop up comes up. And there is an option to add sound. Yeah, I, we trialled it just before the meeting and it did work. Apologies for that. Um, it's all a lot. <laughs> it is. <clears throat> what we can do is we can circulate it and, and um, upload it onto the uh, to see Miss. Um, should, should we carry on with the presentation? Oh. Sorry, Sarah. You can try once more. I try once more and then we can. Oil, but a fickle thing. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Watch it to TV program. <laughs> because that's more time to When in trouble, when in doubt, run that circle and scream and shout. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just, could you hear that all right? Could you hear the sound? No, sorry, Sarah, we can't. Okay. Sorry, I'll, I'll try once more by, by refreshing it and starting again. <coughs> see if that works. In case we don't get to see it, it's, um, it tries to take you through the whole of what neighbourhood network schemes are. I went out and did a lot of filming with, um, with citizens, with some of the assets, with some social workers. And with Graham Betts himself to try and get a flavour of what what neighbourhood network schemes are, and then we've got some good um, good videos as well from the Heart of England uh, Community Foundation that do the do the grant funding for Northfields and for um, Edgbaston, and that's in there as well. So it's um I definitely say uh, it's worth um, it's worth a look even if we can't get to see it to see it now because it does it does sum up everything that, that they've done to, to date. I'm having that as a truck. I'm having well, it's been on the independent video. A lot of people didn't like that idea, but we always felt that well, people technology. actually coming out of prosperous media. I know, it's really interesting. All housing from cousin. Then that's going to the hospital. It's going to have to work on something. Yes, it's all going to the presentation. Shall I just um, shall I just continue? Um, it gives a it gives me a little bit more time to talk through some of the stories <laughs> and examples of um of what's been funded. So this slide is is to sum up some of the the themes of, of, of grants that have been funded. As Carl said, every uh, constituency has got a funding pot and um, can fund um, local projects, projects working locally that meet the needs of the community. So that there's a funding panel that's made up with, uh, with, with, with assets, with um, social workers, sometimes in some places with um, other, other professionals like um, social prescribing link workers. So it's about what the needs in a local area. Uh, and so even when some uh, organisations get money from more than one, one constituency, they may do things in a different way to meet the local needs. So if I just go through, I'm not going to go through quite in that in that order, um, but it, as Carl said, the, the, the grant funding is about creating resilient and connected communities, I would say. It's about activities um, around prevention. Um, and quite long term prevention, some of it. So, if we uh, take income maximisation first, there's, um, there's um, what, some funding that's gone into a number of projects around um, advice and guidance. So, for example, in Sutton, uh, I know a couple of you know the Our Place um, a project very, very well. That's had some funding, um, some post development trust in Hodge Hill has, and such like as well. 
But also some of them have been, uh, some of the NNSs have started to look at job creation and job readiness as well. And um, we encourage them to come together to fund where that's appropriate. So Erdington and Sutton uh, jointly funded um, the Jobs Club at Chester Road Methodist Church, uh, the south end of uh, Sutton Beasy. And then they've got new IT equipment um, to be able to help that Jobs Club. And in the last two months alone, they've supported three long-term unemployed residents into employment there. Um, one of them, for example, is working now at a cleaner in the school. And um, that I was told by the NNS team that popped in last week that it's really, really busy and it's really appreciated that extra funding. But also in terms of income maximisation, I think we need to look at it more broadly as well. And um, a number of organisations are thinking beyond food banks. And uh, a couple of NNSs, a South Yardley, uh, um, in South Yardley and in North, in Allen's Cross, they funded the development of, of um, a food pantry approach, um, which helps people stretch their, their money, their budgets a bit further. And um, as has been said, and I know in Rio we'll talk about, so I won't do much, but um, within the pandemic as well, helping people with the, that budgeting and getting essential supplies. So many of the organisations that we work with um, did that. Some of them were funded by um, their network schemes, others didn't. And many of those uh, that got funding, like, like Mount Zion in, in Newtown, St Chad's in Gravelly Hill, Go Woman Alliance in Allen Rock, they may start doing some, some essential development and then actually also did a lot of welfare support as well um, and fund, funding for lunches or Christmas lunches in the case of, of St Chad's. If I go on to care and support, um, maybe this is an area where there can be more development uh, of work as we go forward. There's been some amazing work in Tele Oak um, at, with Leaf Creative that's developed a lot of the work they've done around dementia support. And um, there they, they put on social evenings um, for people with dementia and their carers, for example, to come together. Um, Sally Oaks also funded board carers to drop in sessions around hidden carers. And in Nishcam, there's been arts and crafts, uh, trips, teas, coffees, etc., for carers um, of, of, pe of, of people suffering with dementia and their carers. Okay, so if we move on to um, the independence at home one. I have to say this is an, an area where um, NNSs have funded maybe less um, than you might expect because that a lot of the independents at home work is about service provision and NNS is not about service provision, it's about activities and resilience within those communities. Um, so there is a, there is a, um, a number of uh, NNSs put together for um, work with Age UK to fund a gardening service so that social workers can um, refer citizens they're working with who can't get into their gardens because um, there's too much um, uh, they're overgrown or where the front paths may be dangerous and they're going to be flip hazards and so there's a, there's a gardening project that Age UK has been doing in a number of, of, um, of constituencies and that's a, we've seen that as a good model of, of moving forward um, to, to work in that way. Social participation is maybe the area that's the most projects have been funded in and um, sometimes just a small amount of money the micro grant funding can really help so again it's in in um, Sutton Beasley, Sing Me Sunshine, uh, Singing Pro Project they just got a micro grant to get a screen and a projector but that meant the citizens there didn't have to fiddle with uh, didn't have to worry about their dexterity or about vision they could they could see the words up there and it's really really made a difference to their mental well-being and um, other, other, other projects around social, there's um, Stitching Projects in Woolly Mammoth has done a lot of great work around a Stitching Project, one in more with Ward End brought two different communities together and uh, they stitched personalised samplers and had an exhibition in two spaces at, at the end of that. And one of the themes that's really come out in lockdown is the Green Agenda, which also fits under social, social participation. There's a number of gardening projects that have really sprung up as people have seen the benefits of being outside. Um, I had the great pleasure during lockdown of going to um, the allotments where uh, St Margaret's Unity Hub work in Ward End and seeing their diverse garden there. New new people coming into that, sharing a, an allotment space. And the, those that used to be on the allotment going, this is wonderful, there used to be three of us, old, old men here, and they brought real life and real joy to the, to the allotment space. Um, moving on to physical, 
Uh, there are, again, loads and loads of um, stuff around here. There's a lot of Tai Chi being funded in parks with Birmingham Open Space Forum. There's walking football, walking groups, chair-based exercises, and, and so on. And sometimes, again, micro-funding can help. So in St Michael's uh, football group in um, Baldmere, they got some micro-grant to cover some cleaning. Um, as there was reduced income coming in at that point, it was something that was preventing activities happening and that enabled walking football and other activities to be happening out of their space. Um, I want to tell, tell uh, some stories around Express Dance, if I may. Express Dance work in a number of different constituencies across the city and I spoke to Faye, their lead, um, just yesterday. She talked about a couple of uh, specific examples. So um, St Thomas is in Sheldon and um, they have 20 places each week, it's usually full. There's no need to have a partner, so that barrier to dancing is taken away. Lots of different styles of dance, but choreographs and music people may have known from their youth. Um, and here in St. Thomas is even the vicar attends. It's part of her health and well-being. I was week. with the last one. Fantastic, I hope you talked about it. Um, and I got a number of case studies there. Um, uh, someone with poor mental health feels better each week, feels more confident, feels a sense of belonging. Um, a woman with a walking aid who um, knows she won't be judged if she doesn't do what everybody else does. And uh, also, they also are running um, projects in Harbour, um, Mo Mopal Hall. And again, that has been a long standing uh, group that's been running, but because of the pandemic, their numbers were quite low. And so having NNS support has really helped increase the numbers there and there was one woman um, quite recently was saying that she'd wanted to come to that class for a long time but didn't have the £5.50 disposable income each week and, uh, and so the NNS funding making that free activity was really beneficial to her and she was already wor worrying about how long it would last for and was reassured that that is for 48 weeks there through that funding. And interesting I thought it was useful to get some feedback as well from um, one of the assets that uh, NNS has worked with, and uh, Faye was uh, very um, happy about the way in which she's worked with the uh, network schemes, talked about the application process being quite straightforward, staff being supportive and open to conversations. Um, just to move on quickly, um, so health and wellbeing, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of work and support around, for example, uh, diabetes programs, or supporting specific groups like um, Asperger's Heroes uh, support group in, in Ladywood. It won't come as any surprise to you to know that digital has become a real issue, um, digital literacy, digital support through the pandemic. We knew it was an issue before and uh, the pandemic shone a light on it. Um, it's been a lot of different activities that have happened in that space. Um, but in the um, in Longridge Day Centre, they have funding from NNS for um, 10 laptop tops and 10 voice assistants like Alexa's, um, which has helped increase contact with family, um, been able to do shopping and such like. And um, there's been some digital lending libraries that have sprung up. So, for example, in Hodge Hill, Go Woman Alliance has been funded to develop a, 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 digital, a digital lending library. Um, there's been capacity building in a number, well, all organisations have been doing capacity building of some sort or another. And, um, and some of, sometimes that's just about networking and bringing people together. So in Salio, there's been awards um, to, um, to run ward-based um, ward networking events. And um, in Northfield, they've been doing a series of community lunches. And so I think the most recent one there was at West Heath Community Association that's been really engaged with the NNS um, as a whole. And those bring together assets um, and uh, professionals like social workers, social prescribing link workers again. Emil's going to talk about the pilots. So I have got a couple of stories here, but I can come back to that if we've got time rather than talking through. But there's a great, uh, again, Go Woman Alliance and Alan Rock's got a great Work, walking with Words um, project for women with men, uh, poor mental health. Some great examples there that I was heard last week. And um, just to finish with, I just I just want to flag that for me, what Nedgen Networks can do 
is exhibit the, the Heineken effect. They can reach parts of the community in Birmingham that other organisations, particularly the council by themselves, cannot reach. And just picking out some, some random um, examples um, from, from the spreadsheet of, of projects funded, um, there's been um, Dollard, which is a support to the Romanian diaspora in the city. They've had funding for two projects, initially as a COVID a relief project and then a, an arts development project. Allies Network, I've worked with before around FGM, they've, uh, they've had funding to do healthy eating and, and lifestyle management for marginalised African communities in Hodge Hill. Bosnia, Bosnia House, working with the, the Bosnian community, uh, particularly across Yagi, but more widely than that, they've had a grant to pull people together and get people um, socialising again. So all Jamal in Hall Green um, has had funding for IA um, information, advice and guidance, befriending, developing a food language, and uh, all, all making sure that those are delivered in, in community languages. And the Polish expat community um, has had a programme of arts and arts and supporting integration. So I think I think there's lots of examples of those um, showing that NNS, by working locally, understanding the needs of the community, managed to reach um, some of the some of the maybe more hidden communities of Birmingham, which is a it's been a really good thing. Whistle stop tour. I hope that's helped. But over to you, Emil. Thank you. Next slide, please. So just talking about the different examples um, in terms of what analysis have commissioned, it's really important to also talk about the pandemic itself. Um, and I think we were really, really lucky in Birmingham to have that in infrastructure ready uh, to respond to the emergency situation. Um, having said that, it's also really important to say that the communities and citizens came together um, incredibly successfully um, during the pandemic and NNS was one of the sort of key tools in ensuring that no citizen goes without support. So with the partnership that we have established with our DDSC colleagues, we've been able to mobilise the COVID-19 response within 48 hours of the first lockdown being announced uh, and that was really incredible. Um, We've asked BBC to become our citywide coordinators for this response uh, in terms of the uh, voluntary community sector. But we've asked our NS leads to change what they did before the pandemic and became our localised uh, coordinators. And that was for them to connect, enable and facilitate support for all citizens. And that included us stepping away from the older 50s approach to actually working with all citizens in the city. And I think it's also worth mentioning that four out of the 10 NSs only started towards the end of 2019. So literally three, four months later, they found themselves in a situation where they, they were responding to the pandemic. So uh, massive uh, congratulations to all the NSs for mobilising this support so quickly. Um, they have built lots of new relationships and they provided a lot of capacity development, capacity building for community assets. Um, hundreds of those community assets closed for weeks and weeks during the pandemic and they really struggled to reopen and then the NSDs with partners have been supporting community assets ever since uh, in terms of even things like buildings and um, uh, some, some risks uh, in terms of uh, ventilation so on and so forth. But in that one year between 2020, March 2020 and March 21, NSDs have actually issued around 250 grants, grants totally uh, around about 1.7 million, and that was pretty much purely the response to the pandemic to ensure our, our citizens and communities are supported. Uh, and no better way of doing that than uh, actually working with those local assets who know citizens uh, on local and hyper local level um, and can respond to the needs uh, there. Moving on, what actually underpins the success of the model, and apologies if you can see this very well, um, this is the recipe for NS, as, as I tend to call it. So that's our building blocks of neighbourhood networks. And there are 10 of those. Um, and I'll very, very quickly just go over those because you weren't able to actually watch the video uh, that talks about it a bit more. So NS is uh, continue uh, asset map across the city, but also work with assets who are mapped 
to make sure that information on connect support is um, updated regularly so that the, the information is now of date. We've um, mapped around about 1800 uh, assets so far, but that will continue uh, moving forward, especially with the exciting news that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, they work with all uh, community based professionals and stakeholders um, in order to get that intelligence into the NMS locally and be able to direct the travel of, uh, of NMS. Each of us has their local um, marketing and engagement plan, um, and that's to be able to promote themselves locally uh, uh, in each of the 10 constituencies. Before the pandemic, they run physical networking events, and they were really successful because they were bringing uh, all sorts of partners together, whether that's professional citizens, community assets, but also social workers, and introducing some of our professionals to community assets and starting that relationship building uh, there. Since the pandemic, they've done a number of events online um, and hopefully in the future we'll be able to do those again uh, in person. Coal production is extremely important to us. Um, we want citizens to be involved in all aspects of NNS and that includes the procurement, design, redesign, all the way through steering groups, grant panels um, uh, uh, and having citizens direct the travel of NNS. The local governance underpins how NMS works. We have uh, a, a constituency partnership steering group in each uh, NMS, and they include lots of different stakeholders, citizens, community based professionals, um, yourselves, um, uh, health professionals, um, community assets, all sorts of other people. And that way they can um, talk about community development projects uh, in that area, talk about prevention and intervention, think about what the gap analysis is. Uh, showing in that area uh, uh, and respond to that accordingly. And that feeds into that gap, gap analysis and then let's go out there and have conversations with uh, stakeholders interested in, uh, in community development, citizens, um, uh, social workers, social providers and other colleagues. They map community assets and that will be able to um, compare what's been mapped for it versus what the need aspiration uh, is and they will be able to uh, produce a gap analysis for that particular area. Capacity building support forms uh, a key area of neighborhood networks, and that's to support local assets to develop, sustain themselves, diversify, um, and that's done through lots of different ways. Benita mentioned that might be community lunches in different areas of the constituency, that might be training, whether that's safeguarding mental health training or things like fundraising and bid writing, which is really important for our community assets to keep sustained uh, uh, for longer. And then, of course, we've mentioned grants process in the past. So each NNS has a small uh, uh, grants and micro grants funding. And NNS budget is spent where um, no other way is there to actually uh, commission that activity. So they work with uh, community assets to look at independent funders, look at any other streams of funding or uh, partnerships, and then commission uh, activities where that's needed and there's no other way of making sure that that exists in, in the local constituency. And of course, we talked about uh, BBSC already. So BBSC are our critical friends, our gateway to the voluntary and community sector, um, and they help NNSs to develop, but they also share and collect learning uh, and evaluation of NNSs. So that's the, the really the building blocks of NMS and why uh, it's such a, a successful model. Thinking about the future, so Neighbourhood Networks 2022 plus, um, we're really, really excited. We have had um, cabinet approval in July last year to recommission Neighbourhood Networks for a further five years. Um, uh, and this includes an expansion of the service from working with community assets supporting the over 50s to now include community assets working with younger adults 18 to 49 with learning disabilities, autism, mental health, physical disabilities and sensory impairment or loss. That's, that's really exciting for us because from the moment we launched NNS, all our stakeholders were saying, but what are the younger adults? So now we're able uh, to support um, uh, those as well. So from April, uh, from the 1st of April 2022, the new contracts start and that includes the expansion of uh, NNS to younger adults. And hence why when Carl was talking about the budgets, there's that additional million uh, a year dedicated to younger adults. Uh, 
There are some other really exciting developments with the neighbourhood network schemes, and I will just talk through them very quickly. We do want to implement the asset-based community development uh, approach within neighbourhood network schemes, and that's all about that bottom-up approach to working with citizens and empowering citizens to identify the dilemmas and challenges that they're facing in the local area and actually take action and be supported to take action and empowered to do so. And that might uh, include some capacity development to support citizens doing that. That might need some seed funding in order to start new community groups, so on and so forth. Um, but also it's that um, approach to really strength-based and asset-based approach to, to create development. Recognising that um, neighbourhood networks are a place-based uh, ne place network, they work really well for some of our communities of geography, but actually we've had a lot of feedback from stakeholders that we do have communities in Birmingham uh, who are thinly spread across the city, uh, especially using some of our communities of interest identity uh, uh, as in minority communities, for whom actually that place-based approach of NLSB in each of the ten constituency doesn't quite work. So we've had a lot of feedback uh, around this and we decided to, to um, run a project called Citywide MNS Connected Communities. And that only started really two months ago, so it's really early stages. But um, what we are starting off with is a, a little bit of a gap analysis research project um, to help us identify the communities who are being spread across the city, engage with those communities, engage with community assets, work with them, whether they're local, regional or even national. Um, uh, and be able to, to support these communities with the same principles and ethos of NNS uh, 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 anywhere else in the city. We also recognise that there are a, a number of activities, things to do, and services delivered online or in a hybrid version. Um, and that was uh, really there during the pandemic, but it continues. Uh, as we're coming out of the pandemic. And actually, there are communities who prefer to meet online rather than face to face and need to be able to cater for both. So, what we really want to do with NNS is to highlight those activities uh, so that they're really easy, uh, easy to find. At the moment, to be able to know whether an activity runs online, you really have to contact the, the, the organisations themselves. So, we want it to be visible on at least on Connect support. Linking to that is actually there are so many different projects in the city helping citizens with digital uh, exclusion. So there are, you know, there's data, there is uh, hardware, there is training available uh, across the city. So we also want to work with providers who support citizens with digital to make be able to highlight all of those areas and all of those projects on connect support so they're very easily accessible in one place. On top of that, we want to set we're running way over at the moment. So could I ask you to sort of move on a little bit? Yeah, I literally have two two or three okay, lines you. left, and that's yeah. it. Thank you. Um, we want to carry on developing community assets to be more digital savvy. We want to also support already uh, 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 citizens who are very active in their communities running block and have local information pages or Facebook pages to continue doing so and be empowered to do that. And we also want to bring providers together in a forum space to feed in the intelligence around digital exclusion uh, to the city's digital uh, inclusion strategy. And finally, we're developing a compassionate communities uh, approach, um, and it's a bottom up approach working with our community citizens around being actually compassionate with each other around death, dying, and loss. And that goes in parallel with the compassionate city UK charter status. And actually, a few weeks ago, we were the first major city in the UK to be awarded the chartered status from Compassion Communities UK. So the two run in parallel will be working with citizens and residents of Birmingham to develop their uh, uh, compassionate approach and make them aware of where to find support if any citizens open up to them. So the three directories in the city, safeguard, so on and so forth. So these are the really exciting developments of MLS moving forward. Um, and that concludes our presentation. Okay, can, thank you all for a really uh, extensive presentation. We have any questions from Karen, just like Karen said. Go on. Possibly so. Okay, I'll be quick. There's, there's lots I can talk about, and, and I recently visited Extra Care because I did get the NSS um, comms coming through to me, and there was there was a, a day at the Extra Care village in, in Longbridge, so that was really, really good. And I met the team there, so that was nice. 
I'm glad Lisa was mentioned because going back to the Education Committee many months ago when I was elected in 2015, it's Barry Bowles and Sue. Oh, yes. yes. And uh, we did a visit to Leeds uh, for education uh, issues and they were really leading the way because we left Gobsmacked and there was lots of other things we wanted to talk about and we didn't. So I'm glad you filtered into them because they sort of had it sussed really in many areas. Um, I wouldn't be a Tory girl if I didn't talk about it. And I know you've mentioned the grants in the in the presentation today. Uh, there was a few figures floating around. There was 250 grants at 1.7 million. There was the 2.8 million grants uh, and micro grants. Now I don't want to focus too much on that because I know time is an issue. I understand the work you do, a complete advocate for it because I know it works in my ward and in the constituency of Northfield. I just wondered with the money, when you say the support system, who actually rubber stamps the spend for the NSS, NNS? That, that's really my question, where you determine that support network, right, that needs to do, we've got that asset, we're mapping that. Who actually says, yes, I'm spending on that bit? Because it wasn't quite clear to me in the presentation on that. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, you talked about need facilitators. I don't know whether you're getting any more for the next five year plan. You've given us a presentation at the end, and I know you've had to rush through it. Um, obviously, Cabinet has approved that now. I just wondered um, because there was a figure of 30 million floats around from Carol Binder at the beginning, and then we've had these other smaller figures, and we don't all read the Cabinet reports, do we, Peter? But there's a lot going on, and, and I don't want to drill down to detail today. That's not what I'm here for. It's just really when you talk about lead facilitators, the funding, who rubber stamps it, and with the lead facilitator, I suppose my question on that is, we talk about data all the time. Where does that data go and who is using that data? Because I am quite conscious that we've got lead facilitators doing things which is fine, they're looking after people, but in one hand, we're also capturing private information, I would imagine, and, um, and where does that go as part of the NNS? Is that by the adult social care? Is it by NNS? Does that just feed into social care? Does it go to a central system in Birmingham? Because um, people are vulnerable. And uh, I'm very, very conscious about what we do with data of vulnerable people in the communities that we are aiming to serve. I hope that's all right, Chair. Yeah, so just very quickly on the very, very quickly on the funding. The, uh, 1.7 million was related to the sort of March 2020 to March 2021 so okay. pandemic uh, call year. The 2.8 million and the 460 grants related to the overall program since sort of the end of 2018 right. up until now. Okay. Uh, so that's the overall. Okay. Okay. So decisions are made locally. So each neighbourhood network scheme as the lead facilitator brings that steering group uh, into life. Uh, and that steering group can be anything between 10 to 25 different uh, uh, multi agency stakeholders, including citizens. Okay. And out of that group, um, there are volunteers who then want to become members of the grant panel. And that grant panel normally has around about five or six different people uh, making the decisions based on applications submitted. The lead facilitator themselves don't take part in that decision making so that they stay neutral. Yeah. But the other members of the steering group who volunteered to be on that grants panel are the ones that review the applications coming in. That yeah, includes your team. That includes uh, commissioners and social workers as part of that grants panel. And the applications are based on priorities that the NNS is put out in the application form to the local community assets. That might be an area of geography within that constituency, or that might be a priority, for example, income maximisation. Uh, depending on the gap analysis that they keep updating as they're going on. Um, so that, that grant kind of makes those decisions on, on what gets funded and what doesn't. What we don't do is we don't say no, that's it. We actually work with the provider, even if that submission wasn't quite good enough, we then work with that provider to, uh, to in, sort of develop the skills and perhaps resubmit again later on or diversify what they wanted to do to meet the needs more of the gap analysis. Um, the data, uh, it's really interesting because they all started at different times between end of 2018 and end of 2019 uh, across the city. So we had 
to uh, 20, end of 2018, for beginning of 2019, and then another call start at end of 2019. And that's because we really struggled with market capacity to procurement to be able to get the lead facilitators on board. So the first year we wanted an implementation year because it was something very new in Birmingham. So we spent the first, we wanted to spend the first 12 months really implementing the model. So there wasn't any hard data capturing because it took probably about three to six months to mobilize the crew to set up the network, so on and so forth. And then we hit the pandemic. Uh, and that was really difficult. We didn't want to further vary the contracts based on the response they were providing to the, uh, to the pandemic. So they all have localized data capture from the assets that they've commissioned to deliver activities. And we only very recently started to um, ask for that data to be captured and sent back to us. So that's, you know, around citizens accessing activities, uh, who are the citizens in terms of demography, in terms of the quality data, are we open and transfer, transparent in terms of who is accessing our activities? And if there are communities who are not, what do we do about it to actually ensure that uh, we are transparent and accessible to citizens? So moving forward, we will be receiving more of that data from analysts from April 2022. Um, but the information they receive from the grantees is anonymized. So they don't get any personal data themselves from the activities delivered that would identify the citizens themselves. Um, and that's really key. Any case that is any pictures, there are consent forms there as well as that we don't share personal data outside of the conditions. I believe there's anything else you want to add to that? No, but in terms of also in terms of personal data, where we do hold personal data is where the social workers are going to refer us. So we have that information as part of our business as usual. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the Um Yeah, thank you very much. Um, what it does prove is that a little bit of money goes a long way, um, particularly working with uh, community groups. Um, and from what I'm picking up, uh, if it was the city council doing it, the city council I know would be risk averse. We can't do that because there's a whole list of reasons why. But cutting through the, the rubbish, you're able to uh, deal with community groups in a far more effective way. Um, in the same way that when we had community chest models, we were able to be far more radical with what we're doing. The one area that you did mention, um, and I know it is a growing problem, um, particularly with energy costs, and that is uh, people's ability and skills as far as cooking is concerned. And I think it was mentioned one of the projects. Uh, but being radical, um, Perhaps you could have a pilot scheme based on slow cookers, which say cost pennies to run. They're cheap to buy. Um, you can throw everything in and it's done. And it's giving people the skills to do it. Um, and it might cost a little bit up front. But I've no doubt it will help um, an enormous number of people and families. Um, and being a war baby, I was always taught to look after the pennies. And I used to get belts around the area if I didn't look after the pennies. Um, but it is one way of making sure that going through the energy crisis, that we are able to help families in a very proactive way. Radical. Practical. Very practical. We actually planned a project in Yardley around cooking together. And That's why I picked it together. up. That's why I picked it and up. It was really successful. The data was showing well over 80% of well being improvements. And we wanted to roll it out across the city, but then the pandemic hit. So that's something we still take yeah. forward. But such a small thing, and it actually improved the city's well being massively. Well, I'm more concerned with the kids, to be honest with you, because there are a lot of children with the energy crisis that are going to go without healthy food and hot food. And it's a small way, you can buy it. You can buy a, a slow cooker for 20 quid if you look around. Um, and you, know, you can buy the cheapest 
nutritious food to put in it and it's going to cook and the kids are going to get fed and that's what i'm concerned about and with the energy crisis i know that there's been a lot of uh comments in the media about people being reluctant now to put on the electric cooker or the gas cooker because of the costs involved absolutely and ju just on families councillor um, the, the other thing that we didn't mention because we haven't had a lot of time uh, was the, the alignment between the adults neighbourhood network service and the early help offer through the children's trust and the education uh, sorry the family, children and families directly uh, so they they've got early help hubs um, which target uh, family support and it, it's before the pandemic again it was very much our intention to align because they've got similar activity to align on an all-age basis our networks with those and uh, others as well but we should certainly be thank you thank you yes just a very quick one to conclude hopefully um i'm a great fan of nns i think it's a fantastic step forward to relocalize the area on social care so it's a really important building block I'm impressed by the building once we built up. And so keen that we build up this link with the early years. Two components which are critical to the system as a whole, which I'd like your comments on. One is the connection between uh, social workers and the network of what is supported. And secondly, the way of connecting citizens into the assets as well. We, we once experimented with local area coordinators, we have one. Well, in very successfully, that didn't go any further. So there is a gap here as to how we connect citizens to the assets, as well as also uh, connecting the social workers into the assets too. Any comments on that? Be interested here. Yeah. yeah. So um, the point around connecting citizens to assets, uh, and I think it kind of cuts through it because social workers also do that as part of their conversation rather than through conversation as well. Uh, but the local area. Local area coordination uh, uh, initiative. Um, we, uh, the city council, actually has uh, an alternative model now to the to the lab model, which is called the CNSO service, community network support officer service, um, and they have uh, one CNSO again in each of the ten constituencies, uh, and they actually do that. They work with citizens directly um, to. Um, so introduce them to community assets, but also support them with wider layers of support that they might have. Um, so that's a really impactful service and it's grown over the last 12 months. It's very new, significantly with some areas having really huge waiting lists now. Um, so we definitely, and, and the CSOs work very closely, they align with NSS and the early health clubs and the social prescribers. So we're really doing as much as we can to have that golden thread uh, through, through the through the different uh, activities, um, and then I think what was really impactful so, for social workers, we've spent you know two three years building that relation with social workers, is the fact that NNSs do visit social work teams probably on a bi-weekly basis, and they can exchange that raw intelligence around what social workers are hearing on the ground from citizens. The NNSs map and <coughs> commission new activities, and they can exchange that. Uh, intelligence and then social workers have a much better understanding of what's on the doorstep and they can introduce citizens to those activities. Uh, but they also take an active part in the NNS, the steering group, the grants plan with the events, and therefore they also engage with the community assets directly themselves. So there's a huge increase of social workers, but also other professionals like our health colleagues working much closer with the sector now which is really incredible to see. There are developments still to be seen, of course, the pandemic disturbed a lot of relationships, but we've seen a huge, a huge change in that. Could I ask another actual point, Chair, that we received a briefing notes on the CNS, uh, right? um, and how this works, maybe just a little memo, I think to the members of the committee, that would be very helpful. We'll do that, Okay, well, can, can I thank you for a really enlightening presentation and for, for the way you answered the question. So, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the staff we've got is on the Abbott Social Care Performance Monitoring Quarter 3, and it was shown by Marie Gabby. Uh,
good morning, councillors. Uh, thank you for inviting us to join scrutiny this morning. And what I'm presenting this morning is the regular quarterly update to scrutiny on the adult social care performance measures. Uh, I'll try and share those on screen. So please let me know if you can see them. We can, yes. Lovely. Oh. Okay, just a quick reminder how they're laid out because you'll see some figures more than uh, repeated more than once. So at Scrutiny's request, we've put the red measures together at the start and then the top five measures we usually focus on by agreement with yourselves and then the full set of measures in case you have any further questions on, on the overall date set. So if I start off with the red measures, um, you'll be familiar that our percentage of people receiving a review has been a red measure throughout this year. Unfortunately, partly that's a reflection of the pressure we've continued continue to see in adult social care due to COVID. Um, and when we're under high pressure, our priority is always to move staff to support our acute hospitals and our discharge process is making sure people are getting home safely and quickly. And reviews is the one area where we tend to have to uh, deprioritize. So our review performance uh, is still a red measure, not where we'd like it to be. Um, we have the performance and improvement plans in place, but it is the measure that gets hit each time we go into uh, a rise in COVID. And this measure, as I say, was around December time. And you might remember we were under extreme pressure uh, as a health and care system at that point. Shared lives, again, recruitment has been similarly impacted by COVID and the difficulty in getting into communities to generate support, uh, particularly to care for the more vulnerable adults we're working with. So our performance there uh, has dropped by one. Um, in the last month, we had 104 placements. We now have 103. Again, we have people move out of this service, uh, often for positive reasons. One, one woman once went on to live independently. So our figure always has to account for those who've left as well as uh, the actual physical increase in numbers. So again, a, a really solid improvement plan behind that, which if COVID rates um, continue to, uh, well, they're very high at the moment, but if we can continue to escalate recruitment, we would aim to, uh, again, we're still ambitious to increase the number of people on shared lives. The last strip measure, and uh, you might remember, I think uh, you had someone from Transition come to talk to you about our transition service, moving people uh, between children's services and adults. Now, performance here, whilst the absolute number of people supported has dropped, and that's what this shows, that's a reflection of the fact that the work in transitions have been a pilot up until this point and we're moving into a substantive long-term service now and recruiting the remaining posts for that service 12 out of 30 are vacant whilst 54 is a decrease we expected that because the number of people in the pilot is decreasing as that comes to an end but what you will actually see in the more detailed data is those 54 people, um, young people, reported 100% satisfaction in terms of uh, feeling they could achieve their outcomes. And you'll see that in the detailed data where these are measures 13 and 14. In terms of the top five measures we usually report on, so we've had good progress around long-term admissions to residential and nursing care. The direction of travel we want to see here is downwards because um, our aim is to support more people at home. During the peaks of COVID, the number of people going into care homes we find rises, 
but we've worked hard. And again, this quarter, we've had a recovery and an improvement in the uh, performance of the service, and we're well above our target of um, 560 people per 100,000 going into care. We're at 516, and as I say, lower is better, so really strong performance there. We've just mentioned reviews. Sorry. Sorry. Should I pause for a moment, Councillor Brown? Uh, I don't think so, no. No, sorry, I think it's techie problems, my side. Direct payments, whilst it's amber, uh, we have gone up by half a percent. So we were 38.1% when you um, had the last quarter. We're now 38.6%. Again, direct payments, where we give people money to manage and fund their own care, was impacted by COVID when people didn't feel confident to go out and use their direct payments more creatively. Um, so whilst we're still amber, we're not going to hit 40% by the end of um, March. We have made good recovery and good progress. And again, shared lives we've just spoken about. I believe we also sent to scrutiny the proposal for the early intervention measure, which is a measure that's replaced delayed transfers of care, which doesn't exist now under the new system. Um, so the early intervention is the national measure that all health and care systems are going to be measured by. And that's what we've uh, shared with scrutiny in terms of aligning Birmingham to the national targets around that. So we hope to see that becoming a more regular reported measure as we move into next year. I normally pause there. Um, because what now follows is the detail of all those scores, but I'm happy to take questions on the red, the top five, or any that appear in here if that's helpful. Did you have a question, Councillor Pogart? Well, it's just a clarification, maybe, to the self chair on the officers. Have we received that note about the revised internet uh, and what I call um, the transfer and um, I think Marie called it something else. I don't recall having seen it, but if we've got it, fine. If we haven't, we have it. I don't recall getting it yourself. It's curious because that's all we can we can yeah. we can chase off. Thanks. We can resend it if helpful. Okay, since we've actually come to a pause point, is anybody getting any questions they want to ask so far? I want to do this pause. Okay. If we want to carry on that, then we do we carry on. Um, I can run through. We normally just run through the top ones, but um, if scrutiny would find it helpful for me to run through all the indicators, very happy to do that, Councillor Brown. I have to use whichever way you think is the most beneficial for the committee. Silence. Do you want to highlight that? That would be fine. OK, apologies to my reception is so poor. Um, it, it's quite crackly, sorry. Don't so worry. We've, we've had a summary, I think, of most of the um, measures on the first page. Uh, we're still above target for our percentage of concluding safeguardings uh, where desired outcomes were met. Um, although it's dropped a bit, uh, it was still well above our target. Uh, and, and we are seeing that starting to recover now as we come out of um, the restrictions of lockdown. So I believe we've really covered probably the other indicators on that first summary page. If I move on to the second summary page, uh, you might recall um, we have a programme called Pure that supports people into employment and that during COVID that measure was suspended because we weren't able to work actively with people around getting them into new jobs during uh, the restriction periods. So we have started to report on that again. Um, 
uh, and the figures are starting now to come through around those people furthest from the job market uh, with learning disabilities or mental health who we are supporting into employment. Within the full pack, there's more details also on the number of people we've supported into volunteering, training and skills readiness approaches too. Um, the next four measures are the measures around transitions and satisfaction rates and the actual numbers of people who have been worked with around transitions. So 11 and 12 are the number of uh, parents or carers satisfied with the plan, both as a number and then as a percentage. And you'll see there's 100% satisfaction this quarter. 13 and 14, 13 is the measure that was the red measure at the start. Uh, but as I mentioned, as this is a pilot, the number of young people supported is naturally ramping down. And of the 54 supported, 100% of those were positive um, about their support. So uh, number of changing places across the city. Again, this is a corporate target and changing places are accessible toilet facilities for people who require one or two carers to support them um, with, with toileting facilities if they're in the community. So we've risen from 12 to 13 within the Birmingham area. And in fact, just this week, we had confirmation of a grant bid we put in for four extra facilities uh, being granted by government. So again, we're hoping to see that number of facilities increase as we move into next year and that funding comes through. So that, that's the run through really of the performance targets, but I'm very happy to take any um, questions on any of those. Okay, do we have any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Okay. Thanks. Just following up your point, Marion, about the transitions indicators 11 to 16. You mentioned it's a pilot. Uh, we're moving next year from April, I guess, into mainstreaming this. So um, does that mean that we'll get more numbers in quarter, well, it'll be quarter one of 22, 23, is it gonna bring the numbers up, numbers of people engaged in this? Yeah, they're, they're revising, um, I think, as you know, every year there's a refresh on the performance targets. So it will be refreshed measures, Councillor Pocock, but we will still have measures coming through they're recruiting at the moment, um, so I would be hopeful that I think the next set of measures you will see in scrutiny will in effect be the end of March now's measures. So it might well be the report after that that you start to see the performance because of that lag with reporting time scales. Thank you. Uh, I think members may notice that Kelly's been able to forward out for everybody a document from Maria that was sent out to us last week so they've got that information to hand now. I think if there are no other questions, I sort of want to thank you, Maria, for the performance monitoring information you've given us over the last year. I think it's been really useful and really interesting. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Which brings us on nicely to section A, which is the work programme. We've probably got no item scheduled for the meeting on the 19th of April. So I'm going to give the members a choice here. We could either agree to cancel the meeting, or if not, we could potentially to put some items on the agenda, which people may wish to see for us. So the choice is yours. Okay. Uh, no, I, I think that within the health community there are many issues that we would like to touch up, that I would like to touch up. Um, health and truth is, is, is one, although it doesn't affect Birmingham citizens directly, I think there is an underlying problem. 
and, and that goes with all MHS animation choices. Um, and I would like that on the agenda for the next year. Uh, so I was going to come on to it. If we actually did sort of not have a meeting on the on the 19th, but I wanted to go on to is to get some indication of what items people would potentially like to see on next year's work program. Just on that note, when we look at the 2.1 then, we've got a whole list here of following items that could be scheduled. I mean, can I just ask how they got on there? Is that just something that you're going to do? That's it. It's a bit of a wish list. Yeah, yeah. 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 so it's kind of a bit of a wish list. So um, we can possibly... I just wondered if there's any on there that hasn't been to the committee this year at all, or last year, or something like well, that. I don't know. Um, I suppose we do talk about how the policies are moving all the time, um, the reports that come through, primary care and the for the update on the mapping system. Um, I just wanted to know that I've got on the list. I think it's possible. I've got to I just wanted to look at the list to think in advance what we want to do. And then wait management, we did discuss with Justin Barney. When this first came up, I think it was called Adult Institute or something like that. Yeah. Weight management is probably a more friendly way of discussing the issue. So I think that one is kind of hanging in there as a problem for Birmingham. Access to primary care, Paul Sheriff, I think it was going to be called in, called in, requested, because of all these problems about getting into primary care. Mm -hmm. And then we left that one hanging in, in the autumn. So I personally, I think that would be good to get that back onto the front line. And about uh, well, well being chair, I think that but well, again we haven't really concentrated on the personnel for that as one of the things to pick up next year. It's just my thoughts. Yeah. I, I, I think we did have um I think it was at the beginning of the year, um, a conference call um with Jonathan Robinson from UHP and he shared with us um, some of the capital investment programs that he got in the uh, intended to own three wards in the old kit. Um, I have personal experience of, of hard ones, um, which I have to say wasn't favourable from the point of view of um, the EU. Um, but I know that they are investing there. So I think it would be helpful if we, particularly as UHV are the predominant providers of health services uh, in Birmingham, if we were able to have a conversation with them and they took us through their capital investment program. Thank you for the opportunity. I don't know what's happening at that moment. I'm not sure. Immediately no, take care of it. Yes. I mean, the other thing possibly we could suggest is that possibly people actually email carry through two or three items that they'd really like to see put on and then carry them to tabulate those and then send them back out to people so we've got an indication of what the committee would actually like to do in its early days and its so the next municipal year. So through you, Chair, what um, usually will happen is that the first meeting of the uh, the cycle will be an opportunity to have a, a discussion yeah. to set your yeah, priorities, priorities for, yes. for the coming year. Yeah. And in uh, uh, Gail's absence, I'll be uh, looking to put together a briefing note to help you sort of summarise what you've seen and what you've talked about. So, and also, Chair, we get the business reports through the full city council that the executive bring forward. And, um, Obviously, those business reports really need to be scrutinised. If we think the city council when that report comes, mm -hmm. I don't believe that, or well, I'm not quite sure about that. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be as a scrutiny and an oversight, at least at some point, on what business report came. I'm not sure about it. Mm -hmm. Because once it comes, it sort of goes back on the shelf. Yeah, it's a business report, and when does that really go through its wisdom? I'd like to give the Latin New Committee have some guidance from this in terms of where it's looking to go to. Definitely. But I also recognise that that committee would be an entity in its own right, so I wouldn't want to hamstring them in terms of this is what you've actually got to do. But I'd like to just have some ideas of like what to do. Councillor Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, just looking at Ron 
here at the moment. Rob, well, you and I, we had a meeting um, with officers um, about looking at the top five, wasn't it? And I, I do believe that early intervention was one, and I guess uh, a, a welcome and update. Uh, I'm looking here as well that um, uh, feedback from care homes. I guess that kind of links with early intervention uh, uh, as well, and again with the NHS, because that's those three sort of compass together. Um, uh, that would be very helpful. Uh, and again, uh, it would be interesting to see the work as well from the, uh, on the health uh, inequalities in Birmingham, which uh, Council Cotton and Andy came um, uh, work with, and we on that board as well, subject of course. Um, so, yeah, but I, I think that would be helpful, just having the current, what we've currently got, and then we say, yes, we'd like to have an update on that, because I'm sure we'll probably do that anyway. I think we'll find that very helpful. Yeah. And we're certainly about the obviously, the day up, so it's going to be coming up. Probably in June or July, I think. Seems to be yeah. three months into the year. Yeah, it's, yeah. I'm sure so, so that there was a, a review on that coming to, I think, maybe to campaign in June or July. What actions will we actually highlight? Can you remind us? Um, well, there's, yeah, there's quite a lot there. It's, it's whether you want to, if there's anything that you're willing and desire to do before this committee and membership potentially changes. Um, so you've got um, uh, some bigger pieces of work around weight management um, and uh, capital investment. In terms of how the meeting in April? Yeah, yeah. Are people happy to do an April meeting? We choose one or two of these items. It's an open question to yourself. Well, it's a question of whether we can get substantive reports yeah. to discuss. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's the that's yeah. the issue. Um, because otherwise, it's a wing of prayer. We're just meeting for the same meeting. Yeah. And that is said as well. What would be the potential of that list because they're getting <laughs> some piece? Um, I couldn't tell you. I'm afraid I don't have the uh, experience. I mean, I think we've got a couple of items and see if we can get something together, get somebody to come in to talk to it. As far as human trainers is concerned, I was have thought that they could provide us with a report of the capital investment that they propose for or bring us up to date with the capital investment that they make, that they are making, because I know that they're doing a substantial amount of arguments. Um and and potentially in the QE sites as well. And I wouldn't have thought that that would take a great deal for a finance officer uh, within UHP to put that together. And then could then join us up, join us five teams or potentially on stuff. Potentially, yeah. Yeah, physically. Shall we say, hey, that's a, that's a bad yeah. option. So the door is having a good option. And uh, one possibility might be to hold that meeting as an informal meeting on teams, which might be just easier with all the other stuff within any. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Because it's informal, we might get information we wouldn't otherwise get broadcast. It could be just a bit of an issue. Sure. 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 Can I call the Council of Council made an interesting point about the Covenant Executive Report and the Scrutiny Report that goes to full council. No, about two years ago, a year or two ago, it was Emma Queens, and I think it kind of negotiated this constitutional amendment. That was done through coordinating on that. So I think it would be good if we could ask coordinating to have a look at whether that's working now, because it's a fair point. It's not something we don't have to look at the executive reports in any way other than commenting in council, and we get probably one presenter. So I think there's a, we could do it, and we can look at that, how well that constitutional amendment is working. And another element was it was going to be early day questions. I think we can have other ways of members raising yeah. issues in council, which hasn't been progressed. No. So if we could refer on to coordinating, this will be included in this year to have a good look at whether that system has worked and how we can improve. And would you want to that at the end of the formal meeting on the 19th? Um, as a second, not, second item, probably not I'd include that on the 19th because I think it needs to go forward to coordinating. Thanks, Colin. But on the 19th, as an informal one, I think that might be the answer to practicalities will all be in, as well as just getting some information if we can. 
So does someone want me looking possibly for an info meeting on the 19th to look at the issue of county territory race and the one that comes to Clancy and Perk Ops Yeah. Yeah. We can run that through teams. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, thank you for that suggestion. That's appreciated. Uh, do you have any requests for calling or any petitions? Can you be them? Any other urgent business? Uh, and what quality to act in the interest of the community. Well, thank you and uh, Rob for sharing the meetings in the RAF. Yes, well, yeah. Also, members of the board, nice to be in a very constructive and